I'm Leon Davis. I am a reader in optometry and physiological optics at Aston University, and I'm also the director of research here. One method that we can use to measure intraocular pressure is a Perkins tonometer. So here is a Perkins tonometer, and let's look through all of the elements of that. At the bottom, we have a battery pack here, which takes four AA batteries that attaches to the bottom of the instrument like so. At the top of the instrument we have a brow bar which can be extended and retracted using this knurled knob here. If we turn the instrument around we can see here a sight hole, this is where the practitioner looks through in order to see the probe. Below that we have two light sources, these are cobalt blue filters because we're going to use fluorescein so we need that to excite the fluorescein. If we turn the instrument around again, we can see two drums here. The first one, which has teeth on, is where you would place your thumb or finger in order to change the pressure dial. We can see the dial where we record the weight that's applied to the cornea. As with any instrument, it's important that we make sure we, we calibrate. So to do that with this instrument, we need to firstly take off the battery pack and we should use a flat surface and place the instrument on its back. We also need to make sure we have the probe in situ and with every Perkins tonometer there's a black disc. This black disc is placed under the head of the instrument and then we use two weights which are placed on the tip of the probe. These two weights are five grams and two grams. For now I will only place the 5 gram weight onto the probe like so and then we need to move the wheel of the probe in small increments until we first notice that that probe lifts like so. So we need to find the optimum position where that probe lifts and then you can bracket that until you find that the probe is just balancing like so. We can remove the weight and then we can check the weight on the uh, probe itself. So in this instance it is 5, so it corresponds with the 5 grams that we used. We would do the same for the 2 gram weight if we found that both are equated to the weights we can use the instrument. So if we find that we don't get the readings we are expecting, there are situations where we can still use the instrument. For example, if we find for the 2 gram weight the pressure is 22 and for the 5 gram weight 52, because the difference is equal, we can still use that, but we have to compensate when we record the intraocular pressure. So we would take 2 off both of those measurements. The recorded pressure between the two it should always be 30. If that is the case, taking into account any difference, we can still use the instrument. What I would do in, in practice, of course, we would be calibrating the instrument on a daily basis. I would keep one of these probes uh, to the side so I only ever use that for calibration and that's never used on a patient. When I see my first patient, I would have a clean uh, uh, probe accordingly. We can use the original probe of a Goldman or a Perkins tonometer, but of course with the risk of cross-infection with things such as uh, CJD, we now use disposable uh, probes. This is an example of a disposable probe. This is the tonneau safe. So if we open the tonneau safe, there are two main elements. There's the black housing, which is what we keep, and the disposable tip. So here's the black housing, and you'll see there's a little notch here, which is what we use to align with the disposable tip. These are all in a sterile little compartment and we simply align the black probe with the tip like so and we can remove that without touching the probe. When we insert the probe we need to make sure that that goes in the, the collar here and also make sure that that is pushed right up against the collar. We can see here there's not a gap between the shoulder of the black probe and the collar of the instrument. As this is a contact technique, we need to make sure we've anaesthetised the cornea. Uh, to do that today, we're going to use proximeticane. This is on its own, and this is taken from the, the, the refrigerator. Before we use any uh, topical drug, we meet, need to make sure that we've met some criteria, and the mnemonic for that, we can use the four Ds, drug, dose, date, and disposal. Once we've achieved all those, we can use the drug. In order to instill a drop, we give the patient a tissue. Now, of course, because this is a topical anaesthetic, we need to encourage them not to rub their eyes. 
The drug takes a few seconds to uh, remove corneal sensation. Um, so we, the, the patient can dab their eye, but, but encourage them not to rub that. We ask the patient to tip their head back, uh, look up to the ceiling, and we're going to place a drop into both lower fornices. We can pull down the lower lid and place a drop in, like so, and the same in the other eye. We need to also instill some fluorescein. We're not going to use any more topical anaesthetic. It's topical anaesthetics are the most toxic drugs that we have in our formulary, so we want to limit how much drug we use. So in this instance, we're going to use saline. So we'll use the fluorette and saline. Again, we've checked that we have the right drug. It's in dose uh, and date and its disposal. So a few drops of saline onto the fluorette. Make sure we shake off any excess fluorescein. And we want the smallest amount really in the eye. So again, asking the patient to look up over to their left and I'll place a small amount of fluorescein onto the bulbar conjunctiva. And for the other eye, again, looking now to the right and slightly up, and again, a small amount onto the bulbar conjunctiva. The patient can blink a few times now. Whilst the patient is blinking, we can then set up the instrument. So importantly, when we use a Perkins tonometer, we must make sure that there are no bags or indeed the uh, elevation device for the chair is uh, in our way. We don't want the patient to be moving or the practitioner to be moving whilst we're taking the measurement. Once we've achieved that, we make sure that the patient is at the appropriate height and then we introduce the probe into the instrument. We also need to make sure that the probe is running horizontally. So we simply look down the probe and rotate that until we can see that the uh, prism inside is running horizontally. Uh, we're now going to uh, stand to the side of the patient and ask the patient to look towards a spotlight or a similar target that they can see. Of course, if the patient um, is an amotrope and they've taken their spectacles off, it may be important to use a target that is clear for them to see. Before we begin the technique, we want to place the probe so that it is on and also at a, at a rough average pressure. So we're going to today use 15 millimeters of mercury. Again, we ask the patient to look straight ahead and we're going to introduce the headrest, which we can pull out like so and lock that off. That's going to be placed on the patient's forehead and then we place our thumb on the instrument like so. Now I'm gonna come quite close. Before I contact the cornea, I'm going to stop. and I'm just gonna make sure that I can lean down and see onto the patient's eye. Then I'm just going to move my head and then introduce the probe onto the eye. You can see that the probe starts to glow. As we do that, we look back down, we rotate the dial until we get the optimum position, and then we can remove the instrument. We multiply whatever we measure from that by 10 to give us the pressure of the eye in millimeters of mercury. The gold standard method of measuring intraocular pressure is Goldman Applanation Tonometry. And this is what we're going to demonstrate here. We're going to take the plate with the pointed side facing the patient, and that goes on to the center of rotation point and locked into place. We then take the probe with this side of the probe facing the practitioner. That then can be placed onto the device and either locked so it's for the right eyepiece or for the left eyepiece. We insert the probe. We also need to make sure that the probe is running horizontally. Rotate until we can see that the uh, prism inside is running horizontally. We need to change the cobalt blue filter, widen the beam so it's maximum width. As with any tonometer, we need to make sure that we are calibrating the Goldman tonometer on a daily basis before we use that on a patient. Place the probe into the device. Then we use a rod, which is placed into the side of the Goldman tonometer. The weights that we use to calibrate a Goldman tonometer are two and six grams. So if we place the rod into the side of the probe, move the rod so that it's positioned behind the probe, we should be able to increase the weight on the probe here until the probe first pops forward, and that should be a corresponding two grams, like so. 
We can then do that again for the six grams and then increase the weight on the dial until the probe first pops forward. We're going to applanate the right eye and we've instilled uh, proximetacaine here, which is the topical anaesthetic, and also uh, some fluorescein so that we can see uh, the Myers and the associated endpoint. We align the instrument with the patient's right eye in this, in this case, uh, with the light source on. We bring the light source to the patient's temporal side and then bring the probe close to the patient. We need to give the patient a target to look at. I would advise them to look towards the side of the slit lamp. We have the probe on 15 and then we bring the probe close to the eye until we applanate the eye like so and then we can look down the instrument and we can rotate the dial until we get the inner aspects of the Myers touching so we can increase the pressure too much we can decrease that insufficient and then find that optimum point which is there to help with contrast of the image it may be useful to dim the room lighting and also introduce a rattan filter or a yellow filter which will remove any unwanted stray blue light from the reflection from the surface of the cornea. So some useful tips when conducting Goldman applanation tonometry might include uh, problems where you find patients have blepharospasm. They're unwilling or unable to keep their eyes open. So in these instances, it's useful to use your free hand to hold both certainly the upper lid and also the lower lid. But it's important whilst doing this that you don't place any pressure on the globe itself because this will give you an erroneously high value. So if any pressure is placed on the head, that this is against the uh, orbital bone. Another problem that you may encounter are uh, either insufficient or excess tears, and that may be caused by the patient's own uh, physiology or by the amount of fluorescein that you have or haven't introduced. In, in those circumstances, if you have too much fluorescein, it's useful to get the patient to sit back. You may want to remove the probe and use a, a clean new probe if there's any excess uh, fluorescein there, and also ask the patient to carefully dab their eye. But again, remembering that we have used a topical anaesthetic and so excess rubbing, uh, or if there are any foreign bodies in the eye, will be not picked up by the, the patient. So any dabbing must be very gentle uh, and very little of. As Goldman tonometry is a contact technique, and of course because we're using a topical anaesthetic, it's essential that we uh, view the cornea before we applanate the cornea, and also immediately after. Uh, topical anaesthetics can lead to corneal melt or corneal desquamation um, and therefore if you do find excess staining it's important to monitor that patient in practice over a period of, uh, of minutes or hours and importantly to irrigate the eye. So when we have our endpoint we need to make sure that we are getting an accurate measurement. So here's a, a set of examples of what we might see whilst we're viewing uh, either a Perkins or a Goldman uh, technique. The optimum endpoint for both techniques is shown here where you can see that the inner aspect of the two Myers, the, the superior and the inferior Myers, the inner aspect is just touching, not overlapping but uh, touching. In this example here we can see that we haven't quite applied enough pressure or weight to the cornea so we need to increase the weight on the dial. Here there's an example where the Myers are crossing over so we need to decrease the amount of weight on the dial. The two examples here are showing misalignment errors. These are vertical misalignment errors uh, and in this instance the probe is too low and this instance here we can see the probe is too high. As a rule of thumb if you see a larger mire compared to the, uh, the other mire, you should move to the larger mire. So when first practicing or starting to use Goldman or Perkins tonometry, it's important that you're looking at the correct mire. 
So because the probe itself has two prisms which separates the image that you see, even when not on the cornea you will see two semicircles and because we're using a transparent plastic here they, they would be seen as white. When we actually introduce the probe and place that on the cornea with fluorescein present we'll see additional myers and those myers will be green because of the fluorescein and it's these myers that we're using to find the endpoint by adjusting the dial on the probe. How are the myers of a contact applanation technique created? So as we introduce the probe onto the cornea and we applanate the cornea, that creates a, a, a meniscus of tears around the outside of the probe. What we actually see are two semicircular myers and those myers are created by the prisms which splits the upper and lower half of this tear meniscus into two parts. And it's the inner aspect of those two semicircles that we need to align in order to find our endpoint.